Welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle Area. The Seattle Epidemiologic Research and Information Center, in collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the VA Employee Education System, and the University of Washington Departments of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, presents the 8th Annual Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. Uh, welcome to the 8th Annual Seattle ERIC Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Clinical Research Methods Summer Session. My name is Ed Boyko. I'm the uh, course director. Uh, the title of today's course is Genetic Epidemiology. The speaker will be Dr. Karen Edwards. Uh, Dr. Edwards is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and the Institute for Public Health Genetics and the director of the Center for Genomics and Public Health at the University of Washington. Uh, the title of her talk today is uh, Introduction and Commingling Analysis. Dr. Edwards. Well, good morning, everybody. The course this year um, has been modified since the last time I've taught it, and I've added four additional hours on top of everything else that I taught in the past. So the first few days will be a whirlwind overview of genetic epidemiology, and what we'll focus on are the study designs that are used in genetic epidemiology, many of the approaches that you've probably read about in the literature. Then the last two days, <clears throat> we'll focus on association studies. And we'll talk about SNPs, haplotypes, linkage disequilibrium, and um, designing case-controlled genetic association studies. So just out of curiosity, how many of you ever have heard of a SNP or a haplotype? OK, well, that's pretty good. OK, so we'll, we'll get there. But um, in the meantime, what we'll do for the next five days, the lectures will focus on, as I said, overview of major study designs in genetic epidemiology. And a lot of the designs that I'm going to go over, or a lot of the approaches, aren't necessarily things that you would use alone in a grant application, for example. But a lot of the approaches that we'll go over today, such as commingling analysis, what I really want to get across are the major issues that you need to think about when you're designing a genetic epidemiology study. And I can tell you right now, the two things that are probably the most important to think about is your phenotype. In other words, what's your trait, what's your disease of interest, and then the genotyping. Most people get carried away and caught up in thinking about the genotyping, thinking about SNPs, and thinking about haplotypes. And what they forget is, if you don't have a good definition of your disease, it doesn't matter how fancy your genotyping is, you're not going to find anything. So the first half of the class, we actually focus a lot on methods that help us to think about the phenotype, help us select maybe a better phenotype, or at least give us some information about what sorts of traits might be heritable. So that's the focus for the first half of the class. And as I said, most people just skip over that, and it's not going to do you any good if you don't think about the phenotype. Then, because we only have five days and 10 hours of genetic epidemiology, what I really try to do is focus on the interpretation of the um, results from the designs that we talk about, as well as some of the practical issues that you need to think about when you're designing your own studies. We obviously can't cover everything, so we try to hit the highlights. <clears throat> In particular, I try to point out what the challenges are with each of the different study designs, as well as the major pitfalls that, if overlooked, can be a fatal flaw in your study. So you won't be card-carrying genetic epidemiologists when you get out of here, but you'll be You'll have enough information that you can uh, do quite well in designing your studies. The other thing we're going to try to do in this class, in addition to the lectures, is also I will try to demonstrate some of the software that we use in genetic epidemiology. And again, I've got to be pretty selective about which packages I demonstrate because um, some of the analyses in genetic epidemiology can run for days and days and days. And obviously, that would not work in here. So I try to pick the software programs that you guys should be able to run on your own when you get away from this course. And I also try to focus on software that is available free off the web. Because again, some of the software packages are quite pricey. <clears throat> and then just to keep everybody awake, we will also do some in-class exercises. So it would be helpful if you could bring a calculator to class. Um, some of the things that we demonstrate. You can do it without the calculator, but I think you'd certainly get more if you brought your calculator with you, or at least a couple of people have a calculator. <clears throat> 
Okay. <clears throat> so the learning objectives, I, as I said, <clears throat> kind of made three broad learning objectives. What I'd like is for everybody to be familiar with the major study designs that are used in genetic epidemiology. And then secondly, to be familiar with the major issues associated with each approach. So again, what are the limitations of the particular design? What are some of the issues you need to think about? Um, and also, how do you interpret the results from those studies? Frequently, um, the results from genetic epidemiology studies are not interpreted correctly, and that causes a lot of problems. So we'll at least point out what the, what the major issues are. And then finally, to be aware of the software and web resources that are available in genetic epidemiology. So as I said, you should leave here with a pretty good understanding of the basic skills that are required of a genetic epidemiologist. <clears throat> now, I don't know that you guys can see this. This actually, in some ways, summarizes the entire week's worth of material. So I thought it would be worth spending some time going over this today, just so you have an idea of what it is we're going to be talking about. Because as I said, this class moves so quickly and there's so much material that I think without the big picture, it's easy to get lost in the details. So essentially what I've done here is laid out what the question is that we're asking, what the approach is that we use to answer that question, and then what the interpretation of the results are. So the questions that we're going to start out with um, today asking is whether or not there's any evidence for genetic influences on our trait of interest. It is not uncommon for people to jump in and say that they're going to do a genetic association study of a particular trait or phenotype and have no evidence that the trait is actually genetically influenced. If your trait's not genetically influenced, it's going to be very challenging to actually show a positive association or any evidence for linkage. And as I said, now that genotyping is cheap, it's fast, and it's easy to do, it is very tempting just to jump right in with a genetic association study or some, side, some sort of genetic study. So keep in mind that before you do that, you need to make sure that there is some evidence that your trait is genetically influenced. The first approach that we'll use to address that question is something called commingling analysis or mixture analysis. And again, this is a type of method where you would not write a grant to do commingling analysis alone. But this is some of the preliminary um, approaches you can take to determine whether or not your trait is genetically influenced. After we have evidence from commingling analysis that the trait is genetically influenced, we can then go on to do some more sophisticated analyses that give us, again, stronger and additional evidence that the trait is under genetic control. And in that situation, we can um, do what we call familial aggregation studies, where we look to see whether or not a particular trait or disease clusters in families. Now, can anybody tell me what, um, as a genetic epidemiologist, what we are looking for is evidence for genetic influences on the trait. But if we look at familial aggregation, what other sorts of things can influence whether or not a trait aggregates in families other than genes? Environment is the other biggie. And we always have to keep that in mind with any of our genetic epidemiologic studies that although what we may be most interested in are genetic influences, you cannot forget about the environmental side of things. We'll talk a little bit about gene-environment interaction, but we'll also talk about, with a lot of these methods, you can't necessarily discriminate whether it's truly genetic influences or environmental factors that, segre or that aggregate in families. And so we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about any of these studies. <clears throat> so those are the familial aggregation studies. We won't spend a lot of time on that, but I will mention them. Twin studies we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about for a couple of reasons. Um, First of all, twin studies were one of the earliest studies that were used to provide evidence for genetic influences on a variety of traits. Um, twin studies are quite useful for identifying how likely um, there are to have genetic influences on the trait and also give us a sense of how much the genetic influences actually um, contribute to the variation in the trait. The other thing is that here in Seattle, we actually have two twin registries. One is the VA um, twin registry, which is Vietnam era veterans. And the other is a population based twin registry here in Washington state. So we actually have two different twin registries 
available to people if you're interested in doing those types of analyses. And they're quite a nice resource. You can do some very nice things with um, twin data that you can't do with other types of designs. So we'll spend at least an hour talking about the twin studies. We then move down into studies where now we need to collect more information than just twins, for example. Now we're going to move down and talk about family studies, family designs. And the one type of study we're going to talk about here is something called segregation analysis. Okay. The purpose of segregation analysis is, again, to provide stronger evidence that our trait is actually genetically influenced. And in segregation analysis, what we look for is whether or not the trait that we're looking at segregates in families. Now, I should say that uh, with the commingling analyses, the familial aggregation, the twin studies, and the segregation analysis, none of these require any genotype data. So this is important to know. These, in many cases, are modeling approaches. And what they are designed to do is help us to determine whether or not the trait is genetically influenced. If it is genetically influenced, what is the mode of inheritance? Is it recessive? Is it dominant? Is it co-dominant? Okay. Now, I, I should ask how many people have actually had a genetics class sometime in their lives? Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Okay. I was going to say, if you haven't, don't worry about it. We're going to keep the genetics lingo to a minimum. And when it does come up, I'll make sure that I explain whatever the relevant concepts are that you need to understand the different analyses. Okay. So probably most people know dominant and recessive modes of inheritance. And we'll talk about those again a little bit later on today. So with all these designs so far, as I said, down through segregation analyses, if you can see that on your handouts or on the slide, that's the fourth box down, none of these types of approaches require genotypic data. So as I said, we're just essentially modeling the trait. We use many of these approaches to, in some cases, decide between a couple of different traits. It might be that you have three or four traits that are related to each other or you think are related to each other. And these can help you to screen and determine which might be the best trait to use in your genetic association studies. Okay. Now, when I talk about traits, um, a trait can be anything that you're interested in studying. So some examples of traits that we might think about are obesity. It can be defined using cut points. It can be defined using a quantitative variable like body mass index. It could be weight in pounds. It could be defined a number of different ways. And many of these methods that we're going to talk about will help you to determine which one of those definitions might be the best for your genetic association studies or your linkage analyses, depending on what you're doing. The other thing is traits can be things like absence of disease. It can be longevity. I mean, I tend to think of traits as disease sort of definitions, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can be creative. So when I talk about trait or phenotype, I'm referring to what it is we're interested in studying. Okay. And again, there's a, a lot of lingo in genetic epidemiology, so I will try to define the terms as I talk about them. But if there's something that I say that you don't know what it is, make sure you raise your hand, and I'll be sure to define it, because there is a lot, of, a lot of terminology to get used to for this class. OK, <clears throat> so the first uh, two days, as I said, we will just talk about approaches that use only phenotypic data, no genotypic data. But then we'll move down into talking about linkage analyses. And there are a variety of different types of linkage analyses. There are some analyses where you only need to have a pair of relatives, for example, siblings. And you can do a sib-pair linkage analysis. Or there are types of linkage analyses that actually require family data, so full extended kindreds. Not just nuclear families, but the full extended pedigree. And we'll talk about those methods as well. Now, you can see that if you start moving into doing the linkage analyses that require family data, these are actually very expensive studies, especially if you have not already collected the families. So before you get to that point, as I said, you want to make sure that your trait is genetically influenced before you go out and collect these families and spend years getting that data ready. Okay? So this is the, the importance of thinking about your phenotype and having preliminary evidence that it's genetically influenced. Um, as I said, we'll cover the major types of linkage analyses that you will either encounter in the literature or that you may actually do yourselves. Most people, if they're going to do a linkage analysis and they don't already have family data, 
you'll probably end up doing some sort of sib pair <coughs> linkage analysis because it's cheaper to collect siblings than it is entire nuclear families. Okay. I've outlined in the circles here two different types of linkage analyses that we'll focus on. Parametric approaches, which are the traditional LOD score linkage analysis using extended kindreds. And probably some of you have encountered LOD scores in the literature. And then also the allele sharing approaches, which as I said is the SIB pair linkage analysis. The other um, issue for this class that's important to keep in mind is that when you're talking about your phenotype, there are a variety of different ways, as I said, that you can define your phenotype. You can either use a phenotype that is a discrete trait. So as I said, for example, um, obese versus not obese, or diabetes versus non-diabetic. That's one way to define the trait. And then another way to think about your trait is using a quantitative trait. So for example, instead of using the cut points and defining somebody as obese or not obese, you can use BMI as the quantitative phenotype. For diabetes, for example, instead of using diabetes status, yes, no, you can use plasma glucose levels, insulin sensitivity, a variety of other phenotypes. And in general, when you use a quantitative trait, you have increased power to detect genetic influences for the majority of these types of approaches. So again, when you're thinking about your phenotype, think about all there, are there alternative ways to define your phenotype as a quantitative trait? Okay. Because quantitative traits tend to have more power, uh, most of the approaches that I'll describe in this class are for quantitative traits. But you should be aware that there are as many methods for binary or discrete traits as there are for quantitative traits. But we'll try to be consistent in this class and go over the, the approaches or the extensions that use quantitative traits. Okay, Just <clears throat> want to make sure that um, you know that I'm biasing you towards quantitative traits, but there are as many methods for the discrete traits as there are for quantitative. We just can't do everything in this class. And then finally, for the last two and a half days, we'll talk about genetic association studies. And I distinguish these from other genetic epidemiologic studies in that, for the most part, genetic association studies are more like traditional case control studies that we're all used to doing. Um, you can also do genetic association studies using cohorts, but again, we'll just focus in on the case control approach since that's what most people have access to. Um, when we talk about genetic association studies, there are many similarities to designing a well, a well designed traditional case control study. But there are some little twists that we have to think about when we're doing a genetic association study. And that's what we'll focus on in this class. We won't talk about the importance of control selection because you've probably already had that in the basic EPI course. And it's the same in this situation. But there are some things that we need to be aware of when we're doing genetic association studies that you don't have to think about in a traditional case control study. And those will be the things that we focus on. The other thing that I've added uh, this year to the class is a couple of hours worth of lecture on, as I said, SNP selection, haplotypes, measures of linkage disequilibrium, how you select SNPs, what's a tag SNP, et cetera. Since most of you, that's probably what you're going to be doing or at least thinking about in your, in your own uh, studies. So we'll spend a fair amount of time doing that. I'll also give you some resources that you can use to s help you select your SNPs. Um, and give you some more information that you can use on your own when you get back because obviously we can't cover quite everything in this class, although I'm sure it's going to feel like it. So that's the big overview to the class. And as I said, the big issue that you need to be aware of is that we're going to spend as much time focusing on the phenotype as we are on the genotype. And I just think that's a, a good thing for you guys to take away from here, if nothing else. OK. So we're going to jump right in and try some of our multimedia experiments here and see how it works for the first day. I thought before we jumped into the content right away that I'd spend a little bit of time going over some web-based resources that you guys should know about. And then in the second hour, we'll jump right into commingling analysis and actually do a demonstration using some software to do a commingling analysis. But before that, let me give you, these are just a couple of um, sites that you should be aware of. The first one we'll go to in just a second is the Rockefeller website. Yurgot, who is probably the father of statistical genetics, or one of them anyway, has an amazing website that has resources that is available to everybody. 
But the um, probably most important resource on their website is a list of software used in genetic epidemiology and statistical genetics. And it essentially lists probably every piece of software that you could ever want to have to do a genetic epi study. And it's quite an amazing resource. It's all in one place. And it's a site that I go to quite frequently and would recommend that you guys bookmark this site as well. One thing that you need to be aware of in genetic epidemiology, probably like many fields, is frequently software um, packages are designed to do very special tasks that may just be a little piece of a problem that you need to work on. But the um, folks who work in this field share this software freely, put it on the web, and is available to anybody to use. The problem is most of the software, the documentation at best is marginal. Um, so a lot of this stuff is, is trial and error that you've got to go use the software. Once you figure it out, then you go back and read the manual. It makes a lot of sense. But generally, it's very cryptic, and it's um, sometimes challenging to use. A lot of the software packages run on different platforms because everybody's doing the software for one particular purpose, and it's not always straightforward. But this is still a, a very good website to know about. As I said, you should be able to find anything there. And I've listed the URL, and we'll go take a look in a minute. The other thing that Rockefeller does that you should be aware of is your God actually teaches linkage analysis courses that focus specifically on traditional linkage analyses. So if you find yourself in that situation, that's a nice thing to, to take a look at. Um, the other resource that is very, very good is the Seattle SNPs resource, which is run by Debbie Nickerson. And this website now has a new server on it called the Genome Variation Server, or GVS, which is very, very nice and, again, very useful in helping you to, to pick SNPs for your studies. And we'll take a look at that site as well. Uh, towards the end of the week, we'll spend a little bit more time looking at some of these resources. But again, something you should know about. The other resource which I think is handy, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, is OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. This site has just about everything you'd want to know about a particular disease or a gene in a very nice summary. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of searching, but we'll, again, take a look at this site. And it's, it's quite nice if there's something, a gene that you've just heard about or a disease that you're interested in, you can go to OMIM and look and see what's been done, get information about the genes, get information about um, the genetic studies that have been done with a particular trait. It's, it's very nice. And then finally, the bane of our existence, power calculations. Um, for genetic association studies, you can't just use the traditional power calculators that you would use in a case control study. So I'll show you some power calculators, um, some software packages that you might want to use. And again, this would just be for the case control genetic association studies. With things like linkage analysis and segregation analyses, power calculations are extremely difficult to do <coughs> and is not something we're going to talk about in this class. OK, so let's um, go take a look at some of these websites. As I said, we want to we want to warm up slowly to genetic epi. We'll be at rocket speed by the end of the week. We'll give you a break today. So this is uh, Debbie Nickerson's Seattle SNPs website, and as I said, this website again is is quite a nice resource for doing genetic association studies. Um, Debbie Nickerson's group has sequenced a variety of different candidate genes, has the sequences for the genes available on these sites has identified the SNPs for each of these genes, as well as providing some software, including this genome variation server, which allows you to essentially look at your candidate gene and select tag SNPs um, that tag the variation in that gene. Now, I don't know if what I'm saying makes any sense to you guys yet, but by the end of the week, it will. You'll know what a tag SNP is. You'll know why you want to select tag SNPs. So you'll have to bear with me. And trust me that by the end of the week, you'll know what that means. So this is a site that um, I would also bookmark if I were you guys. And in particular, the genome variation server portion of this website. As I said, they have some very nice software um, to help you identify candidate genes. And they have some nice pieces of um, software that let you visualize the gene and the linkage disequilibrium within that gene. So 
Part of your homework, although we don't really have any in this class, is to take a look at some of these websites while you're here this week and read over some of this information. I think it'll help you to get a little bit more out of the class. Okay, so um, most of these have tutorials that you can go through to learn how to use the genome variation server and other things that I'll talk about because unfortunately we don't have time to do those in class. But they're very well designed. Um, these actually have very good documentation that allow you to use the site quite easily and take advantage of the resources. Okay. And if you're in Seattle, you can talk with Debbie and people in her group as well if you can get the time to get in to see her. So this is one that's quite nice. As I said, this one's particularly useful when you get to the point of selecting SNPs for your study. Let's try the um, OMIM site now. Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. And um, you can't read this, but I think what I'll do is make a list of these websites and then pass out to you along with that other page um, overview that you couldn't see. So don't worry about trying to see the URLs on here. But as I said, this is the um, website that can give you lots of information on a particular gene that you're interested in, um, also any diseases. So let's, um, well, let's see. Let's look at something related to obesity. So the leptin gene, has everybody heard of the leptin or the leptin receptor gene? So for example, if you type in leptin, we should do leptin receptor. What you get is a listing. Um, this has not just human information, but also mouse models, any other rodent models, essentially anything else that's known. So you have to be a little bit careful about what you select. but. Let's see if we can find something here that looks like it's, let's see, that's gene map locus. Uh, we can't quite, let's see, that's mouse. Let's look at this one and see if this is human. So what you get is a listing of, for example, the leptin receptor. <coughs> tells you what chromosome the gene is actually on and its location. Gives you a description, brief description about the gene. Uh, any other information. In this case, the gene has been cloned, and so it gives information there, including a nice history in many cases of how these genes were first discovered. If anybody's familiar with leptin and using mouse models, you may remember the classic parabiosis experiments that were conducted back in the 70s when they first identified the leptin gene. This is quite a, a fascinating um, story. They took two different strains of mice, the OB mouse and the uh, DB mouse. And in these classic experiments, they actually took two different mice and sewed them together so that they shared their circulation between the two mouse, mice. And in a series of experiments, depending on which mice they put together, they identified that in one mouse there was a genetic defect, so the hormone wasn't circulating. And in the other mouse, there was a defect where there was no receptor. And in a series of quite um, amazing experiments, they identified not only the leptin gene, but also the leptin receptor. So this actually has some um, information in here about those classic parabiosis experiments. If you ever wanted to go back and look at them, you can find things like that in here. They also describe the structure of the gene, mapping of the gene, et cetera. This is quite a nice resource. Gene function. There's a lot known about leptin, so this is um, quite extensive, the molecular genetics. And there's probably association studies, animal models, um, the allelic variants. This is just an amazing resource if you've never looked at it. So I would spend some time this evening um, looking at this website, looking at your favorite disease, your favorite gene, and just get a sense of what's on here. As I said, it, it's quite extensive. Helps you do your literature review very quickly because it points you to all the classic papers and then you can update from there. They update this fairly regularly, so any new um, discoveries or information about the gene or the disease is put on here pretty quickly. There are a lot of other nice features about OMIM, for example. If we go to the chromosome, you can actually look in many cases at the chromosomal view and see where exactly on the chromosome the gene is, what markers are near it, and gives you a very nice visual display of the chromosome. Okay, So this is... Um, Let's just see if we can do this. I know it's a little hard to see, and you can expand the view when you do this at home, but essentially you've got um, several different views of the chromosome. So here's the chromosome running this way, and you can see all the variants, all the markers that are on the gene, 
There's uh, descriptions of um, the genes and everything annotated on the view as well. So you can see right here in the actually highlighted section, that's where our leptin receptor is. You can see what's around it. As I said, you can click on these and it'll give you additional information about the genes, the markers, etc. Very, very nice website. This saves a lot of time doing literature searches. You can come here, get enough background to get yourself started on things. Okay? So that's OMIM. A lot of things in there which we're not going to go through, but um, spend some time looking at that one. Okay, now let's try the Rockefeller site and see what happens. Okay. <laughs> So there is the Rockefeller website. In this case, um, this is actually their labs site. And the one thing I wanted to show you that the software we're going to be using today, NOCOM, is available free off this site, as well as another, a number of other uh, software packages that we'll focus on for the class. The other um, piece of software that we'll use and demonstrate in this class is one called Hardy-Weinberg Equilibrium <coughs> for calculating Hardy-Weinberg. I'll show you how to do it by hand, but it's always nice to have a software package that does it quickly for you. But it's important to know how it works before you actually run the software. So we'll use a couple of pieces of software that's available off this website. And you can just download these um, onto your computers. So this is a listing of all the software, essentially, that I'm aware of um, that's available for doing genetic epidemiologic analyses. And it's nice if you know what piece of software you're actually looking for because you can just go right to it. The other thing that's sometimes nice to do if you have a lot of time on your hands is to actually scroll through this list of software and see what's available because there's actually, as I said, a package to do just about anything listed on this website. They do a pretty good job of describing what the software is, um, a brief description about what it does, and where you can download it. Now, this site includes both freeware as well as things that you have to purchase. But as I said, there's um, quite a lot of freeware available on here. And again, this is um, another one of these amazing resources that you should know about. I'm just going to go down to the power calculators so I can show you some of those. Okay. So if you go to Rockefeller's website, you can find this. Well, there are a variety of them. You can see some of them have names that aren't too cryptic, so power is an obvious power calculator. Um, there are a variety of others. Well, there's a lot, a lot more power calculators than there used to be. The other thing you can do is actually search um, the Rockefeller website for software that does power calculations. So I'm just going to go directly to it. Okay. So probably one of the easiest power calculators to use for case-controlled genetic association studies is something called Genetic Power Calculator, GPC. Um, this is a software package that will do um, power calculations for a variety of different um, uh, study designs. So for example, this is variance components, um, quantitative linkage analysis using SIBSHIP data, um, also does something called the TDT, which we'll talk about in this class. I don't know if people are familiar with the transmission disequilibrium test, but that's another very nice design that you might be interested in thinking about. Also for case control studies, uh, TDT calculations for quantitative traits and discrete traits, case control studies for quantitative traits, etc. So this is actually one software package that will calculate power for a variety of different study designs, whereas some of the other power calculators will only calculate power for example, case control studies, and then you've got to go use another package for the TDT, et cetera. So this one is actually quite nice um, because, as I said, it does it for a variety of different designs. The documentation on this one is also pretty good, which is saying a lot for some of these things. You can use this package <coughs> based on their documentation, which is not true of um, a lot of the packages that are available in genetic epidemiology. So this is another one that I'd take a look at and at least bookmark um, because at some point it's likely that you're going to have to do power calculations for your genetic association study. Okay, well we're actually going to jump in now with commingling analysis. This is a method that is used to provide preliminary evidence for a single genetic locus with a major effect on a quantitative trait. All right, what did I just say? <laughs> 
In genetic epidemiology, there are a couple of things that we have to think about when we're looking for genetic influences on our traits of interest. A couple of the terms that you'll hear quite a lot in this class are single genetic locus versus polygenic inheritance. And it's important to understand the difference between these two things because it influences what you're going to do in terms of your analyses. Now, let's say up until probably the last five years, most of the methods were really focusing, focused on identifying single genes that had a large impact on the phenotype of interest. Okay? So for a lot of the rare Mendelian disorders, where there's really essentially one gene um, that is responsible for the phenotype, that's what we talk about when we mean a single major gene. Now, a lot of the diseases that we're interested in identifying genetic influences for now are what we call complex traits, where there is not a single major gene that has a big impact on the phenotype. Instead, what we're dealing with are probably many genes which together have smaller additive effects. Now, within that group of genes, there may be one or a couple that have a big enough effect that you can actually identify it. But if we're in a situation where something is truly polygenic, that means that there are many, many genes, each with small additive effects that contribute to the variation in the phenotype. If you're in a situation where something is truly polygenic, you will never be able to, well, not never, but currently, you will not be able to identify any of the individual genes that contribute to the variation in that phenotype. This is why it's so important to understand the difference between something that's truly polygenic, something that's a single gene disorder, and then everything that's kind of in the middle. Okay? So what we are interested in doing in genetic epidemiology, especially to convince NIH reviewers and others that they should give us money, is to show that there is a gene that we can actually detect here. Okay? Most of our phenotypes probably are genetically influenced, but there may be some gene or some traits that are truly under polygenic control. And it would be extraordinarily difficult, given our methods right now and given our sample sizes that most of us have available to us, to pick out any one of those individual genes. Okay? So the methods that we're going to talk about over the next couple days are really to help us understand whether or not we have a chance um, of detecting any genetic effects. And so a lot of these methods, what we're trying to do is show that we can at least pick out that there's likely to be a single gene that has a big enough influence on the trait based on the amount of variation that we can actually detect this. Okay? So that's what commingling analysis is meant to do. Really, it's, um, if we have a, a trait that has a single major gene influence, commingling analysis can help provide preliminary evidence that that exists. The other reason we talk about commingling in this class is to, again, get us thinking about the phenotype what are the important issues that we need to consider in terms of defining our trait for our genetic studies? So there are some advantages of using commingling analysis. First of all, commingling analysis is done on data that is um, independent. So for example, we do not use family data or data on related individuals to do a commingling analysis. The other thing, commingling analysis is simple and very easy to do, which you'll see in the demonstration today. And as I said, it also helps us to focus on the phenotype. Now, commingling analysis, as I said, is not something you would propose to do as an NIH grant, but it's something that you should do as preliminary data for your grant. Especially if you have a number of traits that you're considering for your analyses, you might want to do something like a commingling analysis and some of the other approaches to try and figure out which traits might be your best bet. Okay? Like most things, you can't go in with 25 different traits in a grant. You're going to have a huge problem with multiple comparisons. So you might want to rank order your traits, and this might be a way to help you do that, okay, at least as a first screen. As I said, it's very quick and easy to do, so you can go through a number of traits very quickly. This is often a first step and a first piece of information that's used to provide support that you've got a single major gene component. Okay. This can also help tell you, though, if it's truly polygenic, which if that's the case, you should pick a different phenotype quickly. Okay. If it's really polygenic, you're not going to convince anybody that you're going to find genes for that. Okay, So the basic idea behind commingling analysis is that when there's a single major gene that influences the trait, each of the genotypic classes has a major effect 
on the variation of the trait. And again, we're talking about quantitative traits here. So that each genotype at that particular locus has a distribution associated with it. And I'm going to draw this in a second because it makes more sense when you actually look at a picture. But there are a couple of terms here that we should define. The first is locus. Okay, when I talk about locus, I'm talking about the location on a chromosome. Frequently when we say locus, people usually refer to a gene or a candidate gene at a particular location. Okay? But it can be a marker, it can be a gene, it can be a lot of things. So when we say locus, in general that means a location on a chromosome. Loci is plural of locus. Okay? So the basic idea behind commingling analysis is that if we have a single major gene, and let's just say that we have a gene that only has two alleles, so two forms, two poly two alleles at the gene, that if we have two alleles at the gene, we have three possible genotypes. And I'll draw this in just a second. And each of those genotypes will be associated with a distribution in the variation of the trait. So when we say commingling analysis, what we're really looking for is a mixture of normal distributions with the idea that each genotype underlies one of those different distributions. Okay? When I draw it, it'll make a lot more sense. Now, what we have to keep in mind with commingling analysis is we have no genetic data here. We have no genotypes. We have no nothing. This is modeling. And remember that it is always possible that the variability in a trait can be caused by not only genetic influences, but also environmental factors. So although commingling analysis is used to support evidence for genetic influences, it doesn't mean that it's truly genetic, okay? Because again, um, environmental factors can also cause this variation in a trait. Okay. So the way that we interpret commingling analysis is to say that the mixture of distributions is consistent with an underlying genetic effect. Okay. And this is where we need to be careful that we don't overinterpret things. So I'm going to switch to this. And so I'm going to draw this out. Okay. Is this ready to? Oh, look at there. OK, so if we have a gene, um, a little bit more terminology, if we have a particular gene, we usually have different forms of the gene that an individual can have. We call those alleles. So let's take the simplest case where we have a gene where there are only two alleles. And let's just call the two possible alleles. You can either have a big A or a little a. Okay, We'll do a little, a little basic genetics. So remember, everybody has two copies of each chromosome, one you inherited from your mother, one you inherited from your father. So it would be possible on your two different chromosomes to have two different alleles at any particular locus. Okay, so you can only have two of them. So this would be on the chromosome, let's say you inherited from your father. This one would be the one you inherited from your mother. If there are only two forms or two alleles with any particular gene, there are three different genotypes that are possible. Okay. Each one of these individuals is an allele. Together, this is called a genotype. Okay, so the possible genotypes people could have would be a big A, little a, little a, little a, or big A, big A. So these are our three possible genotypes you could have at that particular location. Okay? Now, there are some genes that are very polymorphic. And what that means is there are many forms or many alleles associated with that particular gene. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we actually talk about linkage analyses and things like that. But for this example, let's just pretend that there are only two alleles at this locus. So <clears throat> most of the traits that we're interested in, quantitative traits, well, at least those that we tend to look at, biologic traits, tend to have this sort of skewed distribution. We can think about a variety of different traits here. Cholesterol levels. HDL, LDL, body mass index, glucose levels, insulin levels, you name it. Just about all of our biologic traits have a distribution that looks somewhat like this, <coughs> where this is the um, frequency of whatever it is we're measuring. And this is, let's just use BMI here, <coughs> from low to high. Okay. Now, as a genetic epidemiologist, you would look at this distribution and say, this has got to be genetic, of course. That's what we would say. And being the creative people that we are, I look at this and I say, well, you know, I can imagine there's at least 
a mixture of two normal distributions here, if not three. Okay, so for example, you could, well, this isn't going to be. You can imagine that this overall distribution is actually composed of three different sub-distributions. Okay. Now, if our trait is genetically influenced, you can imagine that each of these different sub-distributions relates to one of these genotypic classes. Okay. So that's essentially what we're saying here. Now, this may not be the case, but you know, let's just put in our, our genotypes here. So you might imagine that this distribution of people, let's say this is the normal end of our, of our trait. Okay? So it might be the people with this genotype who are in the normal range. It might be this genotype that's associated with kind of this moderate range. And then you have these people way out here who might be the ones who have extremely high cholesterol levels, extremely high glucose levels, et cetera. And it may actually be these people that are of most interest to you because these are the ones that appear to be um, at the high end of the spectrum. Okay? So in this case, we might imagine, if we really did have three distributions, that we could say that this trait is inherited in a codominant fashion. So everybody remember codominance means where each form of the allele contributes to the variation in the trait. <clears throat> so that's codominant. What about dominant or recessive? How many distributions would we have? So let's just take BMI again, because we don't really know what the mode of inheritance is. If it was dominant or recessive, how many distributions do you think we'd have? Not three. Two. Very good. Okay. So it could be that if it was either dominant or recessive, we'll talk about that in a second, that you could imagine that actually what we have are two distributions. And it might be that, again, only the people with the two little A alleles are out here in the tail. And everybody else is here in this distribution. Okay? So this might be an example of recessive. You have to have two forms of the little allele, the little A allele, to actually be out here. Okay? If it was dominant, it would be the other way around. That the big A, little A, would be over here with the two little A's. Okay? So dominant and recessive, it's going to be essentially two modes, and depending on what you're calling dominant or recessive to the other will determine where the heterozygotes, which class they fall in. So a little more terminology. These are heterozygotes. And then these two classes would be what we call homozygotes. Okay, so heterozygotes and homozygotes. And those will be terms, again, that we use a lot in this class. So you guys are getting all the terminology essentially in one day. Okay. So you can imagine with commingling analysis, then this is essentially what we're looking for, is we're saying, let's take the distribution of a trait, and let's see if we can um, determine whether or not there's more than one single normal distribution. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that although the overall distribution of the trait is skewed, each of the underlying sub-distributions is normal. Okay. So we're trying to fit a series of normal distributions to the overall distribution of our phenotype of our trait. And as I said, this is only, only works for quantitative traits. Okay. <clears throat> now, the, the thing that's important to keep in mind here is even though we're saying that each of these sub-distributions may correspond to a particular genotypic class, remember, we don't have any genotype data. We're modeling this. Okay. We're saying that if we fit a series of normal distributions to the data, this could be consistent with underlying genetic effects. And this is what we're thinking when we do it. All right? And it's, it's a little confusing because we refer to genotypes, we refer to these underlying genotypic classes, but we don't actually have any genotypic data. So this is, um, as I said, a very nice approach if you have several different quantitative traits that you're considering for your studies. You can do a commingling analysis on this and see which one of these um, looks like it might be the best for your genetic studies. So thank you very much for listening today. That ends this um, portion of the commingling analysis lecture. Thank you.